During Shakespeare's time, England was hysterical about witches. There were witch hunts, and 16,000 women were killed because they were thought to be witches. They were burned at the stake or drowned. Shakespeare knew of this hysteria, so he added them into the storyline so lots of people would be interested in the story. It was aimed at him because of his unique fascination of the supernatural, which is seen as the devil's advocates. At the time, there were apparently thousands of them around. If a woman made special herbal medicines or owned a black cat, then she was seen as a witch. And the real-life Scottish-Norwegian War was a conflict that took place from 1262 to 1266. Shakespeare used Hall and Shed's chronicles to base his account of Scotland's history. It arose over a disagreement on the ownership of Hebridus, a chain of islands off the west coast of mainland Scotland. This war contained only skirmishes and feuds between the kings, but in the end, the Scottish won. People in the medieval ages believed that prophecies told the future. The witch's prophecy planted the idea of killing Duncan into Macbeth's mind. Later on, the prophecies were also the reason for Macbeth killing Banquo. This shows how the prophecies subconsciously suggest that Macbeth will have to use any means to become and stay king. Mentioning that Banquo's children will become kings foreshadows that either Macbeth or his heirs will eventually be overthrown. Lady Macbeth does seize the throne, however, it does result in both of their downfalls. As you see, Shakespeare uses a reversal to simply portray these two characters. In Shakespeare's time, men were usually stereotyped as the more vicious, power-hungry characters, whereas women were mostly followers, small lambs, if I would allow so to do myself. However, in this situation, it seems that Lady Macbeth is the one directing the circus, seizing power, murdering guys, and uh, Macbeth is just following her and just doing whatever she says, allowing himself to be coaxed into even the murder of his own cousin. What a nerd. Wow. As Duncan arrives to this castle, to, uh, I'm sorry, Macbeth's castle, he's so odd. He's like, oh my goodness, it's such a sunny day. What a perfect place. The air smells great. What a wonderful place overall. This is, uh, however, it's extremely dramatic, uh, ironically dramatic to the audience, not to Duncan. As we know that Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are planning to uh, attempt to assassinate Duncan. Uh, and this could, this castle could be essentially his resting place. So with Duncan's attitude of such a high merry person in a place where he could be murdered, uh, seems very ironic. We cut off a lot of the intro and the um, spell making parts because it didn't really get the point. Or yeah, made, it, it did not advance across. the plot. So we're going to have Nathan play this part as a more a more mysterious type of role, a more ominous, uh, power of the unknown sort of type to these mortal men. I want to play Macbeth as a character who has, like, uh, he is the definition of a tragic hero, obviously. He, Shakespeare wanted to portray him like that. So we want to, I want to play him as a character who is good, but has, you know... He has his morals and... Yes, he has, he has ambitions and goals, but overall he attempts to be loyal. So in this act, we're gonna, we're gonna portray him as more of a... Uh, more, in the beginning, a little more of a uh, more loyal, clear character, but after a couple scenes, uh, we're gonna portray him as a character that's become diluted. His loyalties uh, dissolve a, a little bit towards his king and murders coming to his mind. Duncan. And so we're gonna basically have Govin play Lady Macbeth as a ambitious character, at least for this act. It's not until later on in the other act that she starts to show signs of remorse, but here she shows signs of absolute, you know, ambition. She uh, makes a plan. She, so Austin is playing Macbeth. So we're gonna have Austin portray him as a, like a wise king. No, uh, not necessarily wise, but sort of happy. He's not. <laughs> there's a lot of dramatic irony with. King Duncan because he's going to Macbeth's castle and he's you know he's in a joyful mood he's happy he's exhilarated he says the air smells sweet and uh, but, but we gonna... know the audience knows that he's about to be killed and Macbeth's uh, Macbeth's uh, castle will be his resting place so but you know, in the beginning we are gonna try and act him out as being very worried and um, expectant of uh, the result of the war because he hasn't heard back for days of 
what has been going yeah, on on the battlefield. Anxious. So when the um, captain comes in, also he's played very, by Austin. Yeah, <laughs> played by me. He's gonna be very urgent and um, uh, dying to know the news.